yeah, here I'll click, I'm going to click the go live. So, uh, mm -hmm. right now, so it's now stream, we're streaming on YouTube now. So just want to, mm -hmm. everybody knows that. Things just repeated from YouTube. <laughs> All right. Okay, so. All right, without any further delays, let me go ahead and welcome Dr. Raymond Shu. Dr. Chu received the PhD in Information Security in 2006 from Queensland University of Technology in Australia. He currently holds the Cloud Technology Endowed Professorship at the University of Texas at San Antonio, UTSA, and is the founding co-editor-in-chief of ACM Distinguished Ledger Technologies Research and Practice, and also the founding chair of IEEE TEMS Technical Committee on Blockchain, and distributed ledger, ledger technologies. He is an ACM Distinguished Speaker and IEEE Computer Society Distinguished Visitor for 2021 to 2023, and a Web of Sciences highly cited researcher in the field of cross field 2020. Welcome Dr. Raymond Xu. We are extremely excited to have you as our first distinguished speaker for the series, which we just kickstarted this fall. And you'll be presenting on the title, The Cybersecurity Threat Landscape, and you'll be explaining the interdisciplinary challenges and opportunities. Welcome, Dr. Chu. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thank you for having me. And do let me know uh, if I'm speaking too fast. And also, please feel free to interrupt. I mean, uh, I mean uh, during any stage of, of the presentation, we can always make it more, uh, more interactive. So feel free to ask me questions along the way as well. So as, as um, uh, introduced by Dr. Dora earlier, my PhD is actually from, uh, from Australia. So after I finished my PhD, I took a career change. So I went to work for the Australian government, the Australian Institute of Criminology, which is somewhat similar to NIJ in the States, where I actually focus on cybercrime and anti-money laundering. So it's kind of a career change. I mean, we both by moving from academia to, to, to government, as well as from uh, crypto, which is more technical to, to something that's more policy-based. So during that period of, of five years, I also took a sabbatical and came to the US on the Fulbright, where I actually spent some time at Rutgers University as well as uh, Palo Alto Research Center. So during that time, I actually uh, performed uh, my research was actually on criminal expectation in the crowd. So crowd computing back in 2009 was pretty new. So I mean, back then we were actually looking at how crowd services can be exploited by malicious state, I mean, malicious actors, including uh, state sponsor or politically uh, affiliated individuals that I mean to, uh, to conduct, to facilitate various nefarious activities. So I only returned to academia in 2011. And in fact, during my five years there, and again, you may notice I, I tend to move around every five years. I'm not suggesting that I'm going to move anytime soon, but I tend to move around every five years, at least for the last uh, uh, previous two jobs. So I think during, during that time, I also took a spectacle where I spent some time at Interpol uh, in Singapore. So uh, Interpol uh, Global Complex for Innovation was pretty new. It was only established in 2015, and it's actually the R&D headquarters for Interpol as well as Asia Pacific uh, headquarters as well. So back then, I mean, uh, when I was there, I, I was actually focusing on crowd forensic by design. So I'm not sure how, I mean, how many of you are familiar with forensic by design, but this is something I'm going to briefly touch on I mean, in my later slides. So forensic by design is basically very similar to security by design or, or, or privacy by design. So I only moved to US and UTSA in 2016. So this is my sixth year in the States. So I'm actually with the Department of Inform Information Systems and Cybersecurity, where Mozen actually graduated from. So it's good to see you, Mozen. And uh, my current research focus is actually on cybersecurity and digital forensics. And because of my background, I mean, the things I have been moving around between sectors and, um, and disciplines. So my research focus tend to be more inter interdisciplinary. So for example, from a cybersecurity perspective, I'm actually looking at the use of AI, blockchain, and other um, uh, um, techniques, for example, crypto techniques, 
for various applications, whether it's for IO, IoT or for cyber physical systems. And we are also looking at digital forensics as well. So to this presentation, because I understand from Dr. Nora that um, the audience is very, has a diverse background. So that's why today's background is more, that, is more about the breadth rather than the depth. However, if you are interested to, 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 to have a discussion on any of the, on, on the slides, I'm more than happy to actually uh, uh, have, have a more in-depth discussion. So today's, the, the agenda for today's presentation is mostly to introduce our research, but more importantly, to actually explore collaboration opportunities also in terms of joint proposals or joint publications between us. So I'm sure this is no surprise to many of you here, say today, to, tomorrow, and the future is cyber of everything. In fact, if you look around us, whether it's in your office, in your home, in the, on the campus, and, and, and also on the streets, you find that a lot, there are a lot of things that are, I mean, I, whether it's IoT devices or other connected things, they are, kind of, they are always sensing or collecting information about us, about our environment. So together, I'm sure you have come across terminology such as IO, uh, Internet of Everything Ecosystem, Cyber of Everything Ecosystem, Cyber Combined Worlds, and so on. So all these different terminologies, they're kind of more or less mean the same thing. So basically, it's urbanization of our society. So everything around us is has some sort of digital, uh, is, is digitalized in, in some sense. They're always sensing and collecting data either about us or around us. So talking about cybersecurity, I mean, which is the focus of today's presentation. So is it hype or reality? So I'm sure Benjamin Franklin is not, uh, is someone that many of you have read about. So many years ago, I mean, this is one of the many, one of the many quotes that he have, that, uh, that's attributed to him. So for example, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes. But if you add cybersecurity, I mean, or cyber attacks to, to, the, to, the, to the statement or the observation, I'm pretty sure most of us will actually agree with that. Right. Okay. So now the next question is: Will malicious actors? So in this case, I define malicious actor very broadly. So malicious actors can be organized criminals, it can be nation states, or it can even be politically or ideologically motivated individuals or groups. So do you think these malicious actors will exploit vulnerabilities in our technologies? For example, whether it's driverless vehicles drones or other technologies and use these compromised technologies as physical weapons because traditionally we have seen cyber crime as crimes or malicious activity that only happen in cyberspace there's really no physical connotation but moving forward do you think it's possible that i mean whatever happens in cyberspace ha actually has a physical consequences or there's a physical connotation so for example two or three years ago there have been a number of terrorist attacks in europe france Aust i think it's austria and so on where terrorists actually get behind the wheels, they hijack vehicles or they um, go behind the wheels and then they drive the vehicles into uh, uh, places of mass gatherings in order to carry out uh, terrorist attacks. So moving ahead, do you think it's possible that given that um, driverless vehicles or electric vehicles such as Tesla and so on, they're becoming more commonplace, do you think it's possible that vulnerabilities in these vehicles can be identified and exploited so that someone behind the keyboard sitting somewhere remotely, whether it's in, in, in the same country or overseas, can actually um, take over this vehicle so that they can actually do a coordinated attack in the sense that they are going to get behind the wheel. No one is going to get behind the wheel physically, but all they have to do is just to get, I mean, uh, take over the vehicle remotely and then drive this vehicle in a coordinated manner. I mean, uh, targeting places of mass gatherings at, the, at about the same time. Yes or no? Is this Hollywood or, or is this vision? Maybe. And what about if you're trying to carry out cyber attacks concurrently with physical attacks in order to maximize impact? For example, in, in addition to um, taking over vehicles, at the same time, you bring down communication network, you bring down the emergency response, you bring down uh, the, the traffic light systems and so on. So, so that the thing is, so, so you want to actually maximize the, uh, the, 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 the chaos, you want to maximize the impact by causing uh, chaos among the society. So the question is, is this Hollywood or is this a uh, 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 variety? This is, this is a question that we have, we have been exploring even when I was working uh, in, in, my, in my previous job. So again, I'm sure many of you have um, at least watched this movie, Fast, Fast and Furious 8. So you may remember the scene from this movie. So the question is, this is Hollywood, but is, can this actually happen in real life? And I'm sure if you, look, if you do a search for YouTube um, on YouTube and on Google Scholar, you find that trying to... Um, uh, Trying to hack a, 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 a driverless vehicle, whether it's actually to identify vulnerabilities, trying to exploit them, is actually an area that's very actively researched upon at the moment by the security community. In fact, you can also find YouTube video on, on that as well. 
But the question is, do you think terrorists will be able to actually make use of these vulnerabilities to carry out a coordinated attack? Well, time will tell. But my, my suspicion is most likely yes. And cyber threats are increasingly important and strategically relevant to both developed and developing economies. But the challenges such as the following remain. So under a fiscal attack, where it's much easier to attribute the perpetrator. So for example, if I'm going to rob a bank fiscally, I need to be there. So the things I, I can try to discuss myself, but there are things that will be very hard to disguise or to hide about me. Also my height, my build, the way I walk, which is Kate, and, and my accent and so on. Whereas when it comes to cyberspace, it's much harder to actually attribute the source of a cyber attack. So even the last ping IP address is from say a certain country, but the, the, the question is, are you sure that is actually the, 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 the machine of the attacker or is there an uncompromised machine that has been used to attack the, the, the victim? And also the question is, how can we actually determine whether the cyber attack is criminal? I mean, in this case, criminal include commercial espionage or an act of cyber war. So for example, if you look at one of the latest incident solar wings, which I'm sure many of you in the audience are somewhat familiar with, or at least have read about it. So cyber wings, sorry, solar wings has been referred uh, to as an attack by APT actors. See, it has also been uh, referred to as cyber crime or cyber espionage, but in the media article that, that was published in Washington Post and, and, and several others. And it, was, it has also been referred to as cyber war, Possible by this think tank uh, from Washington DC. And the thing is, even there's no consistency, even, even for the same incident, there's no consistency in terms of classification wise of this, whether this is cyber crime or cyber, uh, cyber war. But the question is, why do we even care whether it's cyber crime or cyber war? Because it is the same activity. Well, yes and no. The thing is, even though the techniques that are used to carry out the activity may be somewhat similar or the same, but the motivation and the perpetrators are different, which means that the protocol the response may also be different. So, I mean, typically, who do you think would be responsible to investigate a cyber crime? Will be your, your law enforcement, whether it's your state, local, or federal. But what about cyber war? So that would be quite different because again, that's the escalation would be quite it would be escalated much higher up the hierarchy. Also, most likely it's going to be investigated by the national security agency or even your your uh, the uh, the uh, your your defense or your army DOD. And the thing is, cybersecurity has been around for a long time. If you look at conference like ACM, CCS, USNIC, that's been, they have been around for 20, 30, 30 years. So isn't cybersecurity a thing of the past? Because, and, as, and some of you may have come across the, the terminology cyber fatigue. So in the sense that because CEOs or C-level executive, they have read about cybersecurity so much in the media, in their reports, that it's, they will just think this is just another cause of doing business because we are going to get rich someday. It doesn't matter. So that's why they have this cyber fatigue kicking in. But the thing is, if you look at national, I mean, if you look at uh, some of the threat intelligence or some of the reports that have been put out by whether it's the US White House or the US Office of National Counterintelligence Executive, such as the one that I share on my slide. So for example, 10 years ago in 2011, they have, they have highlighted the importance of cybersecurity, I mean, especially cyber attacks from uh, certain countries. And today, I mean, a few months ago, again, um, and uh, the annual threat assessment from the same community again pointed out the importance of cybersecurity. And in fact, you, as you can see from the language, cybersecurity is not going to go away anytime soon. In fact, it's going to be more important in the, in, I mean, in the years that follow because of civilization, because of the way our society has become more digitalized, more connected. And in fact, moving forward, at least this is a trend in the last five to six years, you find that cyber attacks are becoming more under the radar. They are becoming more sophisticated and persistent. And, and again, some of you may have heard of uh, APT, Advanced Persistent Threats. So basically, many of these attacks, they want to stay under the, they want to hide under the radar as long as they can because they want to, con they want to maximize the impact and the reach of their covert data as frustration. And at the same time, they, they may also be interested, they may also be out to do data injection. And again, adversary machine learning is a term is a, is, is a term that some of you may have come across in the last few years. So basically, the, the machine learning model in most cases is as good as the training data. If we are able to poison the training process, uh, the, the, the model, basically the, the, the AI model that you have deployed in your system may actually recognize certain malicious behavior as a normal behavior. So that's actually one way for attackers to, to circumvent existing security measures. So, so that's why there has been a fair bit of effort in data injection attacks. 
I'm not sure how many of you here are familiar with the terminology force threat cyber operations. Remember earlier I mentioned about um, the, the challenges when it comes to attributing the source of an attack. And also partly it's because of force threat cyber operations. So the definition for, there are a few definitions. So this is actually one definition that is fairly uh, straightforward, I guess. So basically a force threat cyber operation is an attack that's staged in such a way that is trying to pin, that's trying to shift the blame onto another party, whether intentionally or just, just to divert attention away from the real attackers. So in this case, the way they try to stage the attack is they may use a techniques. Um, for example, if, 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 if one group is trying to, to blame another group for, for the attack, they can try to use the language that's commonly associated with the other group, whether it's uh, Chinese, Russian, or, or another language, in order to actually uh, to, to, to make this force, to make this, uh, this uh, operation more convincing. The, then the next question is how easy it is to actually conduct a successful force threat cyber operation. Some say it's easy, some say it's challenging, but again, similar to any cyber attack, there are a number of factors involved. So it really depends on the skill set and the resources of the perpetrators. So if you are willing to spend more, more resources, you, are, you have more access to more technical experts, and also you are willing to spend time to actually research on whether, I mean, both the victim as well as the, well, victim in this case, there are, there are two sets of victims, the victims that, that, that you're trying to target and the victims that, that you're trying to frame. So if you are willing to spend time and effort and also resource into doing this research, then it's not going to be as hard. It's just going to be expensive. So the, the, I mean, the, what are the implications? So in this case, it's going to make our attribution much more challenging, especially for, um, for agencies that do not have the same amount of resource or they do not have the same level of expertise. Then there, there's also implications when it comes to digital forensics in the sense that the evidence that we have in front of us, can we really trust our evidence? This is the same situation that some agencies are facing right now because of defect, because some of the evidence that they have, they are not sure whether that evidence has been generated by AI. I mean, uh, defect, whether it's video or, or image. So, the, so this, is actually a, this is actually a very challenging issue that's been faced by the forensic community at the moment. Can we really trust our evidence? And again, uh, ransomware is a, is a topic that many of you have read about. In fact, I hope none of you have been affected by ransomware. Uh, ransomware has, um, has affected, I mean, uh, organizations in both the public and private sectors, as well as universities and individuals. And this is just a few months ago where the US House Committee on Energy and Committee, they are actually, commit, they are actually conducting a hearing on uh, stopping ransomware. So this, again, is actually a topic of ongoing research. So now I'm going to briefly introduce some of the cool stuff that we do, but I must, I must emphasize that we are not hackers because there is a clear, there's a distinction between hackers and researchers, I guess. So this is actually a few years ago. We actually started on this with my uh, st students back at UTSA. So back then we were actually interested. So, um, and again, I, I think cryptocurrency is, is, is something that most of you would not be unfamiliar with. Um, in fact, some of you may, may even be doing crypto mining. So, I mean, back, I mean, access to Bitcoins on the wallet without knowing the username and password. If I have access to, to your, to your uh, mobile, mobile device that actually has the Bitcoin wallet installed. So basically what we did was, we actually uh, studied two popular Bitcoin wallets as you, seen, you can see on the slide. So one of them is Ethereum. So basically we actually perform an offline, we, will, we actually identify vulnerabilities in the wallet. In this case, the, it's actually a wallet application installed on Android devices. We actually found vulnerabilities in the wallet that actually allow us to do an offline brute force attack. So the difference between online and online, offline brute force attack is if it's an online attack, after say three, three unsuccessful attempts, the account will be locked out. So basically you have to, you have to reset the password. Otherwise, there's no way you can gain access to, to that. But offline, it, it, I mean, if you're able to do an offline brute force attack, basically you have all the time and, 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 and resource in the world to actually try to crack that try to crack the, um, the, the, the account. So basically, so, so basically, we actually found two vulnerabilities that actually, first of all, the first vulnerability allow us to do an offline brute force attack. And the second vulnerability allow us to actually, to actually compile the entire dictionary that actually allow us to do a, a password reset. We are alerting the, the actual account user. So basically, we were able to reset the password even without knowing the username and password. And by doing that, we were actually able to obtain Bitcoins in the wallet we are knowing the user, the, the user credentials. In fact, this research, uh, a few years ago when I went to um, Dublin, so I actually have a chat with one of the investigators from, a, from one of the financial intelligence units. So they actually, they actually have a case then 
where they mentioned that they actually have a number of Bitcoin wallets belonging to uh, serious and organized criminals that they are currently being investigated. But the thing is, they do not, they are not cooperative because they do not to hand over their, 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 their password. So they are not sure what they can do. So in fact, we share with them this, this research and I believe it, it, it has helped them to actually get access to, to ho hopefully the, the, the Bitcoins in the wallet. So this, this research actually has real world implications. And again, this was actually a few years ago, I think just a year before I moved to, to the States. So basically we found vulnerabilities in commercial 3D printers, uh, I believe it's MakerBot. So, we, so what we were able to do is, we were actually found vulnerabilities in the, in the, in the 3D printers and we were actually able to uh, exfiltrate data covertly from the, from the printers, even though we are not directly connected to the printer. So as long as we are connected to one of the devices, whether it's an IoT device or whether it's the, it's the laptop or, or computer within the network, we are able to bounce from, from, that, from that device to this 3D printer and exploit the vulnerability to actually exfiltrate data from the 3D printer. Now, the question is, you may ask, why are we interested in 3D printers? The thing is, most of these 3D printers um, are, are actually not deployed at home. They are, they are deployed in the, in the commercial setting, in an organization setting. So then the next question is, what are these 3D printers used for? Most of, most of the time, they are used to print prototypes. Uh, uh, it, it, so basically, in other words, they are, they are IPs. So basically, we are able to get access to IP without spending a single cent on R&D. By, by identifying and exploiting vulnerabilities in, 3D, in these 3D printers and then associating their, their, their print job. And this is again a research that we've done a few years ago. So we, we actually found vulnerabilities in iOS devices, which is your iPhone and your iPad. We were actually able to exploit the parry mode. So in other words, so I'm sure many of you, when we travel, whether you're on the, whether you're on the plane or, 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 or on campus, you actually try to charge your device um, say by plugging your device into, into a socket or into an, an art system, or the, the, the entertainment uh, system in front of you when you fly. So the thing is, many of these are actually an art computer. So by plugging your, your device, your iPhone to actually this device, and by default, many of us will actually trust the other device, right? So once you trust the other device, so we actually make use of that trust to actually uh, try to exfiltrate data from, the, from, your, from your mobile device, even though we don't do not have access to your mobile device by simply getting access to the device that you have trust. So this attack that we reviewed was very similar to the iOS trust checking attack reviewed by Symantec researchers at RSA a year later. I mean, the, the, the key difference between our two attacks is our attack re relied on the physical uh, connection to exploit the trust, whereas the other attack actually will perform over Wi-Fi. So in both attacks, as you can see from this slide, we were actually able, to, depending on, on the state of your, uh, of your mobile device, as possible, if your mobile device is actually jailbroken, we're actually able to get pretty much everything that you have sync with your trusted device because you have, you have trusted it. However, if it's non jailbroken and depending on whether uh, whether your files has been has been backed up or not, so if if your files have been backed up, we are able to get access to almost much everything. Of course, in this case, if it's password protected, we just have to do a brute force. But remember, this is an offline brute force attack, so it's not that hard to con to conduct. We just have to spend more time and and computational resource on it. And dating app, dating app is, is another topic that we have been working on for quite, quite a few years now. And why, why dating apps, you may ask. The thing about dating apps is, personally, I find dating apps interesting. Not that I'm a user of dating app. I don't use dating app, just, just, just a disclaimer. But what I find is dating apps are interesting in the sense that they store a lot of information, sensitive information about the user. That this information that you would not likely find in other applications, whether it's social, social media or your Snapchat, whatever your sexual orientation, uh, your, your, the, your message and, and so on. And in fact, we found that many of these dating apps, they are not secure. In fact, they are not designed with security in mind. So for example, in this paper, again, with my student from UTSA, we actually um, uh, subject a number of, we actually test a number of these popular dating apps like Tinder uh, and a few others. I think we tested about eight of them. We actually do a very simple man in the middle attack. So basically we install a proxy server and the, and the app actually uh, connect to the, to, um, to the server through the proxy server. So which is very similar to possible if you go to campus, you want to use a campus Wi-Fi. So basically we are the campus Wi-Fi, so to speak. So we are the man, man, man in the middle. And we find that many of these apps, even though they have end-to-end -end encryption, but their end-to-end -end is actually they are from a mobile device to our proxy server. So basically we can see almost everything. And in some of these cases, we are even able to hijack the authentication token because, for example, some of some some users may not be willing to share um, their, 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 their legal name or their, 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 their true name. 
but where else we can find the same information on Facebook. And some of these dating applications, they require the user to have a Facebook account in order to join, to, to, to use the application. So basically, in this application, we are able to intercept the authentication token. So in other words, once we intercept the authentication token, we are able to log in as the user to the Facebook account. So right now, we not only have access to their information on the dating app, we can actually log into the user as themselves and get access to their Facebook account. So we have a wealth of information. And again, this is another application that we work on as well, uh, have happened, which is another application, which is uh, another category of application. But in this case, we are more interested in the forensic aspects. So we, we, we want, so we were trying to find out what, we, what type of information we can get if we actually have access to the Android and iOS device where these dating apps were actually installed. And again, we were able to uh, 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 acquire a wealth of information. And as you know, dating apps, there are many different audiences. They serve different audiences. So you have Tinder, you have Grindr, and so on. So this is another uh, app, app that we actually investigated a few years ago. And we were actually able to make use of their GPS triangulation. So based on this, um, uh, feature, we were actually able to identify who are our neighbors who are actually users of this app. So in this case, this app is actually for swingers and for people who are in, into certain lifestyle. And of course, there are certain implications. I mean, you, you may ask, so what if they if a user of this app? There are, there are national security implications of dating apps. So for example, as you can see on this slide, so it can be used for honey traps. And also, I think there's also national security implication. So for example, the US government is actually forcing one of our Chinese firm to sell the uh, gay dating app over because it's because they are worried that the data may actually be used for extortion or for, uh, for other nefarious purposes. So as you can see, as I mentioned before, dating apps, they store a wealth of information, but dating app, whether it's security or forensics, what we found is surprisingly, it's actually understudied as compared to other uh, app category such as your Facebook, your, your, your social media and so on. So this is actually an hour that we have done uh, a few years ago. So I was very interested to see what type of data can we exfiltrate and in, in what way that is going to be covered. So in, in this case, we found that we are actually able to um, exfiltrate data from uh, compromised devices, whether it's your iPhone, whether it's your iPhone, Android phone, or even your laptop or your systems, using inaudible, uh, using very high frequency uh, sound. So basically it's between 20 to 20 to 21 kilohertz or 22 kilohertz as you can see. So as you know, for Android devices, they have permissions. But if you try to associate data with in this frequency using a the speaker, there's no permission required at all. But of course, that is a that is a trade-off. So the accuracy is between five meters. And but the thing is we can actually increase the range if we actually use a high gain microphone or if we can actually use another drone. This is a, this is an idea that never occurred to us until we until we saw this, this research. So basically this research is actually, uh, is actually by another group from Singapore and, and Israel. So they actually want, not to, they actually want to extend our, our, our technique to actually expand the, 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 the range by using the drone, something like man in the middle. So basically the, the, the data from a mobile device is going to hop to, actually, to be sent to this uh, man, in, man in the middle before being be, be sent out to the outside world. And again, Personally, I actually, I actually enjoy doing some of the offensive research, some of the uh, vulnerability identification and exploitation, but it's not as easy. So this is something I'm, I'm uh, well, I'm not sure whether it's embarrassing or not. But anyway, this is this is a paper that we might, we, we, we have quite a hard time in publishing because when we send to a few 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 uh, venues, we kind of encounter the, the, the same the, the same resistance before we managed to publish two years ago. So uh, last year, sorry. So basically, in this work, we actually found a way, we actually come up with a package where we, we so we, we actually come up with a framework where we actually package existing tools to exploit vulnerabilities in, uh, in, in, in virtual machine that has no fix. And we actually really, because as part of the, because um, I mean, for this, for, this, for this previous submission, we actually submit to a conference and because it's an ominous submission, we actually want to share, we actually want to share the code to, so that the reviewers can actually test it and make sure that it works. But we will actually criticize for sharing the code because they were saying that, well, uh, as you can see, as, as you can see from here, producing an offensive tool, we are proposing the, the countermeasures is irresponsible and they actually want us to pull, pull the code off GitHub. So right now, I mean, if you're interested in the code, we can share with you uh, privately offline. I mean, assuming that you're not going to use it maliciously, but up to this stage, there's still no fix uh, to, uh, to this attack. So in, in more recent years, we have been using AI 
and machine learning to actually, because most of these techniques are actually very, very manual in the sense that we actually reverse engineer the app and in, in order to, to, to identify the vulnerability, whether it's in the code or actually in the implementation of, of, the, of the application. So for example, in this work, which was uh, uh, last two years ago, we actually uh, come up with a lead learning based fuzzing methods. So some of you may be familiar, uh, fuzzing is actually a tool that, that, that you can use to identify vulnerabilities, whether in your systems or in your devices. So basically we use a deep learning based uh, approach to actually uh, enhance the fuzzing. So we were actually able to identify more vulnerabilities um, compared to existing uh, fuzzing tools. In fact, uh, more interestingly, we actually use our tool to actually uh, on the commercial uh, middleware from Huawei. And we actually identified nine previously unknown vulnerabilities, including flaws that can lead to uh, DOS or system crash. Now, the next question is, can we actually use some of these vulnerabilities that we identified to facilitate um, the digital forensics? Maybe from a technical point of view, yes. But from a legal point of view or from a, uh, from a political point of view, it may be too intrusive. It really depends on the jurisdiction that you're working in and also the evidence law of, of the jurisdiction. So this is actually an hour that, that we work on. So as you know, many of, as I mentioned before as well, so many of the uh, network traffic, they're they are end to end encrypted. So basically, even if, if you intercept the, the network traffic, it's really garbage to you unless you, you have the, dec the decryption key or yeah, if you know how to decrypt the message. But the thing is, even though they are actually encrypted, but there is actually a, a difference in, in terms of the data stream, uh, the, in terms of the randomness of the data stream for video data or for certain data types. So in, in other words, we are, we are able to do a, 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 um, some sort of a classification of, of the encrypted network. So basically this is actually an, an idea that we have from, a, from a, uh, an earlier work. So some of you may have may be familiar with WeChat. So WeChat is, a, is an application that's perhaps popular among the Chinese users, especially in China. So basically WeChat, in addition to the functionalities that you found in, uh, in your Facebook Messenger or your Snapchat and so on, they actually allow users to exchange rep packets. So basically fund transfer. So basically what in this earlier work, what we're interested in is, are we able to identify uh, fund transfer or some sort of these financial transactions, even though it's encrypted? So what we did was we actually found that there are, there are, there are certain features that are, the, the data is actually not as random as as they should be. And based on this non-randomness, we are actually able to distinguish, we are able to se separate out or classify it uh, or filter out um, uh, encrypted data that, that consists of this uh, fund transfer or uh, financial transactions. And similarly, for this work, we were actually able to, to by, by studying the randomness of the different data streams, we were able to do classifications of the different data types, even though, I mean, we are, we are the need to actually decrypt the, 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 the network. So this is actually uh, more recent research. So, uh, I mean, recently in the last two months, we actually have received three NSA grants. So this is one of the three NSA grants that we received. So what we are working on is actually to use machine learning in, to help us to do cyber, cyber threat intelligence and hunting for IoT systems. And as you can see, in, in this case, I mean, in this project, we actually have three major objectives. So the first objective is to create some sort of generalizable IoT knowledge base. Because as you know, IoT devices, they are very diverse and they have many, diverse in the sense that in terms of device type, in terms of data they collected, in terms of the OS, uh, the, the file system and so on. So what we want to do is actually to create a generalized IoT knowledge base, um, comprising information that's going to help us in our track hunting or depending on what, what you want to do, whether it's for forensics or whether it's for certain, certain specific track hunting. So we want to create these different data, these different uh, knowledge bases. So the second objective is actually to integrate this knowledge base and the standard log files and other necessary information to be able to answer and uh, reason over questions from analysis. From analysis. So for example, this analyst may be interested to find out, okay, can you tell me the, the devices that will actually assess on this time, this date, I mean, within, within a certain time frame by a certain user that should not have assessed uh, these devices uh, within this time frame. So based on the query that actually issued by the human analyst, I mean, the, the system is able to go to this different data set, do the, do the analysis, the, the mining, and then return the, 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 the solution back to this analyst. And of course, this, the, object, the last objective is basically to integrate this implicit uh, feedback between the analyst and the chat system to, improvement, to improve the performance over time. So it's an iterative process. We want to, based on this human interaction, basically this is, it can be it considered this as a human in the loop. So based on this interaction, we want to refine the system so that it gets more accurate 
I mean, as, as, as we build our knowledge base, and also as we actually, um, based on the feedback from the human analysts, we can actually fit that uh, back into the, into the system. So this is actually the second project that we received um, in the same time period. So basically we want, we, we want to design different techniques that kind of, whether it's fully automated or semi-automated uh, semi to help us to detect the risk and also to mitigate the risk in terms of uh, AI-based attacks. So in this case, we are, we are thinking of, it, it could be uh, data injection attacks, like I mentioned earlier, or data island poisoning attacks. So because these days there are a number of attacks that are actually being carried out using different AI tools. So we want to be able to be, we want to be more effective in, uh, in reducing the false positive so that we can, we can also do the triage as well. So again, as you can see, there's some suggestions of human over here. So it's, it's also human in the loop. So this is the third project that we received. And again, this is the human actually plays a more prominent role in here. So basically we want to have a more, we want to have a focus on the human in the loop, explainable AI. Why explainable AI is because, I mean, I mean in this particular project, we, we want part of, part of the result that we get from this system, we want to be able to use this result as evidence that can be admissible in the court of law. But if you use the black box AI, because black box AI, as you know, is opaque. So basically, I have no way of um, knowing how. I mean, how? Okay, I mean, from, from the input to the output, I have no way of how. I have no way of explaining to the court or to the jury how how the input. I mean, how I uh, go from the input to the output. So that's really so. It, I mean, it doesn't help when it comes to you uh, presenting this evidence as an expert witness in court. So that's why we want to have an experimental AI in a sense that we are able to show step by step or at least close, close to that to, so that we can actually explain to the jury, to the prosecutor on how we actually arrive at this evidence. And in fact, we are, this is a project that's been uh, in collaboration with my colleagues from University of Texas in, Dal in Dallas. We are also recruiting a two-year postdoc. So if you have any students or anyone that you know are interested, who's also a US citizen and PR, uh, you feel free to refer to me. And this, the last project also has a more forensic uh, uh, feel to it because why forensics? One of the things we found that when, when it comes to IoT forensics and IoT security, even though they kind of go hand in hand, they complement each other, but IoT forensics tend to be the poorer cousin in the sense that this is a research, I mean, this is a, a quick search that I've done from a Google Scholar just yesterday. And if you look, papers, well, IoT security over the same time period is 20,000. So there is a lot of work. That, I mean, basically IoT for us is, is an area that's actually under, under study. But at the same time, the thing is IoT forensics is most of the forensic work is actually reactive. But what we want to do is we want to make it more proactive. That's why we want to actually use the forensic, uh, okay. For example, we want to be able to make use of a forensic evidence that can, that can help, help us to actually uh, inform the decision making. For example, some of, some of, some of the data we collect, collect as part of the forensic investigation can actually be used to train the AI model because we know that after the forensic investigation, we know that this, this, these activities are clearly malicious. So we can actually, so basically this is uh, some sort of your, of your labor data. And in fact, this is an hour that we've done. So we were trying to look for, because we are trying to do a, a survey of IoT uh, of research, the various topic. So in fact, as you can see, IoT for us is too small to even appear as a bubble. So you have authentication, you have cloud computing and, and IoT, smart city, industry four and so on, but there's no IoT for us. It's just too small. Which, which is in a way is good as well because this is actually a research opportunity. I mean, for those of you who are interested in forensics or integrating forensics and security. As I mentioned, uh, I think uh, as Dr. Dora has uh, introduced earlier, so I mean, if you're interested in blockchain, so these are two of the initiatives that we have recently uh, established. So one is the new committee on blockchain and DLT. So it was only formed a few months ago, but right now we have over 100 founding members from all, from all the continents except for Antarctica. But my understanding is there's no country in, 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 in Antarctica, so I think we are pretty safe in that sense. And as part of this technical committee, we have 12 special interest groups. We have five subcommittees and five chapters. So if you're interested, feel free to join us and also sing out with any of these special interest groups, subcommittees or chapters. We, are also, we also have set up a new journal with ACM on DLT. And this is designed to be a, an interdisciplinary uh, journal. So we accept submissions from different disciplines, from business, from technical, from economics, law, and so on. And we should start uh, accepting submissions by the end of this month. 
And when it comes, so why did I introduce about blockchain? Because to me, I see there's a lot of potential to use blockchain in IoT, security, and forensics, as well as cyber security. So for example, one of the areas that we are currently looking at is how can we actually use blockchain to, forensic, to facilitate forensic by design? I've mentioned this terminology twice, but I don't think I've really explained it. I, I think I have a few slides at the back. No, sorry, I'm, I missed it. Okay, so basically forensic by design is, as I mentioned earlier, is very similar to secure by design and, and privacy by design, but it, in a different way. So for example, when a system is hacked or when a system is compromised, where do you look for evidence? Right now, I have no answer for you because it really depends on, on the system setup. It can be on the device. And in, in this case, the device can be your, the, your user device or can be the device that is used by the vendor or by any users. It can also be the server or the edge device, or it can be in a cloud, uh, cloud computing, or for example, if, if it's in a home environment, for example, uh, if you use uh, say Amazon uh, uh, AWS, it may, may be uh, in an Amazon AWS server, or if you use the ring camera or some, some other, uh, systems, it can actually be at the service provider. So basically, the, I mean, in other words, the, the evidence actually exists in many different places. And it can be very challenging when it, when it comes to con, uh, conducting a forensic investigation or, or a criminal investigation, because right now the, the investigation, the, the data is actually not in one central place. It can be on your device, it can be in the cloud, it can be somewhere else. And in some cases, it may even be in other jurisdictions where the law enforcement agency has no power over I mean, to, to actually acquire the, the data. So what we are proposing in this is actually to design a system that's forensically friendly in the sense that, so the thing is, think of it as a forensic black box. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept of black box <coughs> or a copy recorder. So for example, when the aeroplane goes now or when there's an accident involving the aeroplane. So usually the FAA investigator, they'll go to, the, they'll look for the forensic web, sorry, they'll look for the copy recorder to actually understand what happened before the plane goes down or before the, before the accident. So what we are proposing here is some, somewhat conceptually very similar. So can we actually build this digital forensic black box? It can be cent centralized or it, it can be decentralized. It really depends on your system setting. So this forensic black box is going to collect data. In this case, we do not want to collect all the data. We want to collect only data of forensic interest or of investigative interest in the future. They can actually be, and again, this data, the thing is, this data is not used only for forensic investigation for the future, but it can also be used to, to actually inform your machine learning more, your AI training, for example, this so so basically, so so basically this 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 one this, this I mean, the data uh, collected by this digital forensic black box has two purposes. It, it's used for forensic as well as it's used for security measure as well. And also because when it comes to forensic investigation, you have to ensure the integrity of the data. You have to ensure the chain of custody. So in this case, blockchain can actually play an important role in ensuring the chain of custody. So however, can broad, so the next question is. Can blockchain be used in other forensic applications other than to preserve the integrity of data to help you in the chain of custody? The answer is yes, because the thing is blockchain can also be used to facilitate data sharing. So in, in our research that I'm currently working on, so we are trying to use blockchain to actually build an ecosystem, a data sharing or data uh, trading ecosystems. In the sense that, uh, can we actually use blockchain to actually uh, do a peer-to-peer system, uh, to, no, sorry, let me rephrase. Can we actually use blockchain to design a platform that can kind of be used to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer machine learning uh, training, for example, your federated learning, but in the peer-to-peer -peer manner? Because as you know, peer federated learning is actually still rely on the, on, the, on the central model that kind of train the global model based on the different updates of the, of the local models from the, from the local users. But what we are trying to propose here is trying to use, trying to design a blockchain-based platform to actually do a peer-to-peer -peer federated learning. So it's moving away from a centralized server for federated learning. So this is actually another research that we, that we are currently working on. So I think with that, I end my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. I hope I have not spoken too fast. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Chu. This was a wonderful presentation. Um, let's just, yes, we do have a question from Dr. Steve. Hey, please go ahead. Okay. Dr. Chu, thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting. And I'm particularly intrigued by your, your background photography and how you have worked with so many various communities like law enforcement. So my question for you is, as you work with these other communities in an, with an interdisciplinary focus, 
do you tend to see very open collaborative environments because you have similar interests uh, or are there challenges to collaboration with particular communities that may come up say from the sensitive nature of the data or the techniques or the methodologies, you know, and especially thinking about law enforcement sensitive data here. All right. Thanks, for, I mean, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Rudder, for, for this uh, question. So, in fact, my background is somewhat unique because what I did not mention in, in my in my introduction is I used to work for, uh, I, I used to work in the Singapore Police Force as a police officer before moving to the, to the US. I mean, before moving to Australia. So even when I was in Australia, because of my work with the AIC, the Australian Institute of Criminology. So many of my research are actually funded or are actually conducted in very close collaboration with uh, the law enforcement because the AIC, actually we, 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 are, we, are, we are one of the portfolio agencies under the Attorney General's Department, which is somewhat similar to the Department of Homeland, Homeland Security in, in the States. So basically the Federal Police in, in Australia, uh, the, the Financial Intelligence Unit and AIC, we are, we, we, we are under the same portfolio. So, so we work very closely with them. So when it comes to working um, in collaboration with, um, uh, sorry, when it comes to collaborating with researchers or agencies from different sectors and uh, uh, discipline, it can be very challenging when it comes to access of data in, in data. So for example, um, so okay, let me, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to think of an example to, to actually explain better. So for example, um, I mean, uh, one of our challenges is usually getting access to the raw data because even, even though, for example, especially if you're working in academia, even though you have, we have a very close working relationship with them, we have an NDA with them, in many cases, you find that it's quite challenging. It's quite impossible for us to actually get access to data, especially if the data consists PII or even for forensic data. So that's why this kind of motivate my research. This kind of motivate my interest in, in using blockchain to facilitate data sharing. So what we are trying to propose in this work is for example, can we actually design a platform in the sense that, for example, I mean, say, say because right now there are 18 audience. So assuming that I'm, I'm a user, I'm interested to, to, to answer a certain question, but the, the 17 of you actually have access to, you actually have different data set that can actually help to answer my question collectively. collectively. The other thing is you are not able to share your data set with me because of uh, various reasons. So what, what, what we are trying to do here is actually to use a blockchain to design this platform where we, have, we can actually train the model to actually go to your different respective uh, users to actually uh, get the answers that I want. And then, so basically, yeah, this platform is able to present the, the results collectively to me, without me having access to the different data sets. So this is actually, this, is, this platform is actually uh, basically inspired or motivated by my experience working with these different agencies because it's very challenging or in some cases, impossible to get access to their data. And getting access to data is not the only challenges, but I mean, there are also challenges in terms of the language. In this case, I'm not referring to linguistic language, but I'm more referring to the, the language that have been used in the various disciplines. So for example, survey. Survey can mean very, very different things in different committee. So survey in some committee, it means questionnaire survey. Whereas survey in some other committee can mean a, a deep review. And this is, this is just one simple example of, of the different uh, differences in language and also in differences in the research methods as well. So one of, the, one of the things that I often have to navigate is trying to explain the importance of, say, a certain method or the importance of certain focus from one discipline to, to my collaborators in a different discipline. Because to, to, to my collaborators in a different, possible, I mean, say, between technical and non-technical. So, so usually for, for, for those in computer science or for those in more technical research, to them, I mean, a, a research is considered interesting if we if we, if they come up with new algorithms or if, we, if they come up with a, a new uh, a, a, a new platform or a new system. Whereas this is not so much a case for so for say someone in criminology or someone in, in legal studies because to them if you're if they're able to use something even very simple a, a, a much simpler AI technique that can actually help them to solve an interesting social phenomenon that's going to be that's going to be you know uh, uh, intellectual merit or or noble contribution. So trying to navigate that is also not, sometimes not easy as well. So I hope I have answered your question in a roundabout yes, way. thank you. No problem. So, and again, thank I really so have no Dr. answer. Oh, no problem. If I may continue, I really have no answer in how to, I mean, in what's the best way to actually um, collaborate across this discipline because it's just a matter, I think, usually, uh, I still remember one of, one of my collaborators once said that, um, she doesn't really like uh, interdisciplinary collaboration because it takes a lot of time compared compare to uh, if she actually collaborates with someone from her, from her own discipline. Because the thing is, both parties are, 
if you are involving only researchers from two disciplines. So basically, researchers from both disciplines need to take time to actually understand the, the techniques or, or where the person is coming from from the other discipline. So it takes time to actually build the trust as well. It takes time to understand the other viewpoint. So that's why when it comes to interdisciplinary research, it takes time to build a trust, to understand the perspective from the other side, to actually navigate the, I mean, the different difference, the, the differences between the disciplines. But I think it's actually a very rewarding exercise. Personally, I, I, actually, I, 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 I actually enjoy the interdisciplinary collaboration. Thank you. All right. We do have a question from Mr. Patrick. Hello, yes. Uh, so I had a question earlier on in the presentation, Dr. Chu. You mentioned that one of the emerging problems in cybersecurity has to do with data injection and how there can be what's known as kind of poisonous uh, training data that can be infecting in uh, training models. And that can, of course, come out when the models perform whatever action is being required of them later on. Um, I wanted to know if you had any, I guess, examples um, of how this was. this has been used lately in cyber attacks and also what are the leading strategies and difficulties when it comes to handling um, this poison training data and what are the I guess main ideas of verifying that training data is secure for training a model? Yes right now I don't think I have, I have, I have the answer for you in terms of what's the best way to detect uh, data, data injection because similar to cyber attacks I mean at the end of the day how effective or how, how effective is the detection really depends on how skillful the attacker is and the techniques that they use right now I think mean, detecting data injection or even carrying out data injection attacks is actually uh, is actually an, a research area that's very active because if you look for example if you look at the ICML some of the top conferences in this area the ICML triple AI IJCAI you see that there's that is a lot of work right Right. They actually propose new methods to, to both carry out data injection or data uh, island poisoning attacks as well as data injection attacks. So in terms of um, real, because I think your, your, your other question is um, about real world cases where such attacks have been carried out in practice. And again, I don't think it has, I mean, I'm, personally, I'm not aware of any, any cases that have been discussed in the media, but the thing is, it may be going on. The thing is, I mean, when it comes to data injection attacks, I mean, the thing is, those I mean, incidents that have not been, been reported in the media doesn't mean that there's no uh, attacks. That, I mean, there's no such incident that's going on, but it may be the fact that uh, those attacks have, have not been detected yet. So, so in, in, in short, I have no idea on, on, I mean, I have no answer as, to, as in um, how this one have, how these attacks have been used in practice. Thank you, Mr. Patrick. Thank you, Dr. Chu. <laughs> All right. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Chu? So if I if I may, if I may ask, so, so is this a topic that's of interest to Steve? If is that, if okay. No, oh, sorry. I think Patrick. I think Patrick was the one who asked the question. Sorry. So is this the topic that's of interest to Patrick? Um, all right. Okay, so uh, Mr. Patrick, if you don't, if you're unable to, um, you know, talk, probably you can leave a response for us in the chat. And let's see if we can move on with any other questions anyone else has. All right, so let me just quickly check the YouTube channel to see if we have any questions for you over there. All right, everything looks good. All right, Dr. Chu. Okay, so if we don't have other questions, Mohsen, did you have any question for Dr. Chu? No, I just enjoyed the presentation. It was great seeing Dr. Chu again after so long. I haven't actually seen him in person for how many years has it been? Dr. Two years now. Yeah, with the yes. pandemic and all, we haven't had the chance to get together. So, so by the way, are you, are you in the ICS? I think, uh, next month in Austin? ICIS? Um, no, I oh. submitted everything to Hicks to go to Hawaii. 